The historical roots of the Liberal Democrats can be traced back over 300 years. The Liberal Party and the Whigs, their predecessors, were one of the great parties of state throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Governments led by Gray, Gladstone and Lloyd George dismantled the remnants of the feudal order, reformed the political system and laid the foundations of a welfare state. Yet in the 20th century, the Liberals were eclipsed by the rising Labour Party, and by the 1950s had been almost extinguished. Successive waves of revival gradually weakened the stranglehold of the Conservative and Labour parties, and in 1988 the Liberal Democrats were founded, through a merger between the Liberals and the Social Democratic Party, itself a break away from Labour. Practical politics has changed hugely throughout this history, but the values of liberalism remain. A belief in liberty, in a fair, free and open society, in international cooperation, and, more recently, in environmentalism. The Liberal Democrat History Group promotes the discussion and research of this rich legacy. We publish the Quarterly Journal of Liberal History, together with a range of books and pamphlets on liberal history and liberal thought, and we organise regular discussion meetings at Liberal Democrat conferences and elsewhere. As Paddy Ashdown, the first leader of the Liberal Democrats, explained, those who won't learn their history are condemned to repeat it. The Liberal Democrat History Group exists to make sure that we can, so we don't. You can subscribe to the Journal of Liberal History and find out more about our activities and publications at our website, www.liberalhistory.org.uk. Good evening, conference. Welcome back for today's uh, final session. Uh, we are moving to F29 to F34, following a review of party bodies. The Federal Board have put together uh, two constitu a constitutional amendment, uh, and from that flows changes to standing orders and regulations. Um, I'll explain the voting later, but the constitutional amendment will need two-thirds majority. And, and if that's carried, we then go forward to uh, change the um, sending orders and regulations which flow from that decision. 
So can I ask um, Prubere to stand by and invite Flo Kuklis to move the standing order, sorry, the constitutional amendment. Thank you, Chair. Um, conference. About 20 months ago, myself and three other colleagues, Bess Mayhew, Steph Aquaroni, and Tim Pixton were asked by the President to join the party body review group. The PBRG was to be ably assisted and supported by Jack Coulson. My thanks to them for their time, commitment, willingness to consult with organisations and individual members across the party and to discuss with them their hopes, fears and concerns and indeed gain insights as to how things might be improved. My thanks also to Mary Rainier Wilson, who has just joined the review group. We were tasked with looking at how the party structures worked for organisations at everything from applying to become a recognised party body to obstacles that prevented them from having a full role in the party or to giving them a higher profile. In short, how they might be brought more into the life of the party. We wanted to look too at how best the party could make use of those bodies at whether we needed to change the rule book to encourage, enable and empower them, and if so, how we could make that happen. It was quite a challenge. The proposals you have before you today are the results of 20 months of speaking to hundreds of party members through webinars, surveys, written submissions, face-to-face -face meetings with organisation chairs and committee members, and bringing organisations together for debate and support. We wanted to listen and learn, to know what was important to them. As a result, earlier this year, an interim forum bringing together party bodies was created. With two joint chairs elected from those bodies, it is already providing a united voice for those organisations. So what did we learn from the process? Party bodies wanted more certainty as to their role. They wanted reduced complexity in party processes, a greater opportunity to influence policy in their particular area of expertise and to link with our parliamentarians. They wanted also the ability to come together to discuss matters of mutual interest and create the opportunity to work directly with headquarters, both individually and as a group. If the proposals go through today, it will be the start of a process that will refine legal requirements in areas such as Papira and retune business processes, giving assistance, advice and access to decision making. So briefly, the proposals from PBRG are to enable approved organisations to be redefined as affiliated organisations and the current status of being either an associated organisation or a specified associated organisation to be discontinued. To institute a new, quicker, easier process for recognising party bodies as affiliated organisations. To confirm the role of the party bodies forum, which brings together organisations to talk to each other and to the party about mutual interests and for mutual support. To use federal party websites to showcase party bodies and enable them more easily to attract members. In addition, there will be the right for... directly with our MPs and Lords where policy issues are being discussed. The review group also recognises the enormous opportunity that organisations have to build the party through reaching out to interest groups and like-minded people with all the potential that presents. We also looked at the status and role of Liberal Democrat overseas parties. They believe themselves to be in limbo. Following extensive discussions, they're no longer considered as party bodies, but are working as Liberal Democrat parties through the Federal International Relations Committee. My thanks to them for the many hours of discussion and time given to our deliberations. There is more to do, 
but these initial proposals will enable new ways of working and new opportunities for all of our existing party bodies and those new ones currently awaiting approval. In conclusion, our thanks to all those who have taken part for your time, knowledge, experience and for allowing us to develop new routes to change. Finally, Chair, on behalf of myself and my colleagues, I would like to congratulate Bess Mayhew, who did so much work on the PBRG, on the birth last week of her beautiful daughter, Ada. We wish them both well. Thank you very much, Flo. Um, you dipped out slightly with your broadband connection there, but I think uh, members will have heard most of what you said. Can I ask Suzanne Fletcher to stand by? And I call Prue Bray, who is uh, chair of ALDC, to speak in favour of the changes. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, this looks horrendously complicated, but it's actually extremely simple. So we have lots of groups of people with similar interests in the Lib Dems who like to band together in special interest groups, which we call party bodies. And at the moment, those groups are split into two categories. The way that works is obscure and cumbersome. And while some have special rights, others get completely ignored by accident because there are no proper processes for keeping them in the loop. And if they go off piste, it's really painful and complicated to deal with it. So very sensibly, having had a properly conducted review, which has involved as many of the groups as possible, here we have a set of proposals to improve the situation so that everybody knows where they are and the party can actually make use of the expertise and knowledge that we have in all those different groups. And even better, this is being done with everyone affected, not done to them. If this passes, there will be only one type of special interest group and they will basically operate under the same rules as local parties. I don't believe any existing organisation with special privileges will suffer any detriment. So young Liberals will continue to have rights to committee places, for example. And arrangements are included to manage the transition from the current situation to the new one. And as part of the review process, as Flo said, representatives from all the different groups started meeting regularly in a party bodies forum, which seems to be working very well and will continue. So the reason there are several agenda items to deal with this is that references to these party bodies are scattered about the constitution, standing orders and election regulations, and all of them need amending. And we also need a new section formally laying out the rules under which they will operate in the future. We do need all the different parts to pass for this to come into effect. And the hurdle is quite high because constitutional and standing order amendments require a two thirds majority. So please do listen to the people who are involved in party bodies who want this to happen and vote for all of the changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prue. Can I ask uh, Stefan Agarone to stand by and uh, call Suzanne Fletcher from Stockton? Thank you. I'd just like to thank everyone that's worked on this very much needed reform. But I do see a big omission. And as well as there being the ability to nominate a retro policy working group, as in B on line 70, we all know that issues spring up between policy making and at short notice, and our parliamentarians need to speak out on such. There's a wealth of knowledge and experience between SAO and AOs in the party. And although Flo has just said that uh, there is something in the uh, new setup that means they will be uh, involved in uh, various working groups, I think she said, or things um, that have just cropped up. I can't see that anywhere in the motion uh, that we've got before us. And I did paste into a Word document and do a search on Parliament and nothing came up. Um, so maybe it's just accidentally not in there. But the AOs and the SAOs aren't just there to talk to each other and maybe work on longer term policies. They can be, and they want to be used. Just my ask is to be consulted or even listened to on policy issues that jump up and need a response. That way, it saves some time on any research by our parliamentary people, and the best possible message gets out there. My mother-in-law used to say, never waste time, paper or string. Well, don't waste expertise and accumulated knowledge either. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Suzanne. Can I ask Lee Dark to stand by? And I call Stefan Aquaron to speak in favour of the changes. <sighs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm delighted after 10 years of attending conference that I'm finally giving my first conference speech. Flo has spoken about how we develop these proposals and what they involve. And I want to speak to why I believe it's so important to support this sort of reform and create a clearer, more user friendly way for the richly diverse range of interests that are aligned to our cause as Liberal Democrats to associate formally with our party. Having gone from poacher to gamekeeper in the technology world, I've spent some time leading organisations through the process of modernisation and transformation. And what I've noticed is that the ones that have thrived have successfully redesigned their organisations to put their customers at the heart of their decisions. A great deal of the work involved in doing this is about reforming the way these organisations are structured helping people master the latest in modern communication skills and changing the processes by which they operate, all with the simple goal of putting their customers at the heart. These organisations don't do this because they're nice, they do it because of competitive threat. And the parallels with what our party needs to do to reform the way it works are numerous. We too have internal structures that are unfathomable to any reasonable human being. They can risk alienating the very people who should be at the heart of our party's strategic decision making, our members and potential future members. We too need to modernise the way we communicate politically to take note of the fact that global digital communities are just as important to people's identities as geographic ones and how to move with the times to find new, better ways to make society work and not just stick with what we know because it feels comfortable. And we too need to recognise that we are in a broad and widening competitive landscape, not competitive with other parties so much, but with other ways that people can be politically active and shape the world as they would like to see it. If to officially become part of the Liberal Democrat Party organisation, you need a degree in Liberal Democrat convention, the persistence of a member of the special forces and the bureaucratic appetite of a totalitarianist state, then you might be forgiven for seeking progress elsewhere. But if we want to attract people whose values are liberal and whose causes are aligned, then we have to make being a Liberal Democrat something or other the most effective way for our members to make change happen. Our structures and our processes need to be enablers of participation if we're to succeed. After all, if we believe it's good enough for the electorate, then it should be good enough for us. Much good work has already been done to this end, and I commend and thank everyone involved in getting us to this point. These proposals are another important step towards getting our house in order, modernising our party, and taking the long-term moves towards unprecedented success. Please vote for 24, uh, F29 to 34, uh, thank you very much and good evening. Thank you very much, Stefan. I'm now going to invite Lee Darg from Birmingham Ladywood to submit the debate. And after Lee has spoken, we will move to a series of votes. Thank you, Chair. It's great to speak with you again, conference. And yeah, peak Lib Dem moving constitutional amendments. Uh, a huge amount of work has gone into the initial reviews. So thank you to Flo and the team and indeed Toby Keynes and the team that did an initial review a few years ago. Huge thanks to Jack Coulson and also Bess Mayhew and congratulations on Ada. Uh, and also Gary Shelton, my co-chair of the Party Body Forum and all of the party bodies that took part in the consultation. This really was a huge huge consultation and it was wide, it was across the party, it was across the country. We got many, many people to, to feed back into these proposals. But as you can see just from the text, the amount of work that's gone into preparing this is phenomenal. So please do, I urge you all to vote for all of the uh, amendments that you can see uh, listed today. The Party Body Forum, which I co-chair with Gareth Shelton, who's the chair of uh, Plus Lib Dems, um, We've had a really successful time and the FPC have been fantastic. So, Suzanne, you mentioned about making sure that working groups are important. They absolutely are. FPC and we take this very seriously. We're even having discussions on can we improve the way that working groups are formed and how people are selected. So, absolutely, this is a key priority. Uh, Prue, as ever, you make really complex situations incredibly easy to understand. So, thank you for that and all of the support and challenges that you've rightly given 
fairness. Uh, and you've also talked about a liberal principle that all party bodies should be offered an equal opportunity to success and support. And that's vital, too. Uh, and Stefan, great to see you having your first speech. And what a great speech it was. You rightly talk about the need for organisations to be agile and to be adaptive and responsive. And as part of the review, we've got further work to do. We're looking at better ways to support communication tools and digital tools, uh, better access to member support, because the more effective that party bodies can work, the more they can get out there and do the campaigning on the issues that matter most. What I'll finally say is that the Party Body Forum was set up because I didn't need a constitutional amendment. We've been such a great collaborative working body, and I'm going to surprise you all, conference. We did it with no powers whatsoever. We've just done it by working together. And the difference it's made in making sure we all understand each other's concerns is really, really useful. So please conference vote for all the amendments thank you to everybody involved the work you've put in is phenomenal make sure you get a rest after conference and hopefully we'll see this passed thank you chair thank you very much lee so we're going to move to um voting on f29 which is the constitutional amendment if that receives two-thirds support we will then move to change standing orders and some regulations and rules that follow from that constitutional change so I can invite you to vote on F29, which should be in the polls section now. So the constitutional amendment has overwhelmingly been passed. 119 votes to seven against. I think that's about 94% in favour. Um, as we've now amended the constitution, we need to amend a couple of things that flow from it. F30 is standing orders amendments. Uh, they, they too need a two thirds majority. So can I invite you to vote on those now?
Well, thank you, conference. You have passed those standing order changes by 117 votes to three. We were looked a bit silly had you uh, not been consistent. Uh, we're now moving to simple majorities on the other changes in the regulations. So two more votes. We can ask to take the first one now. Okay, conference, um, F31 has been passed by 110 votes to six. There were the rules for bodies. We now move to um, the regulations for elections, which is um, F32 through to F36, four, sorry. Um, I'm gonna ask you to vote on those now.
Thank you. So we've now voted on F32, 33 and 34 and 109 in favour and six against. So that package of reforms have now all been passed. And I thank the Working Party for their um, months of uh, hard work. And I also thank my aides, Duncan Brack and Nick DeCosta, for helping me through the votes. Uh, I'm now pa passing over to Joe Orton, who will be chairing F35. Thank you. The global reach of the UK Liberal Democrat Party. The UK Liberal Democrats are the UK's third national party. However, they are the UK's leading political party in global reach. This is in marked contrast with the UK trend towards isolationism, jingoism and nationalism. They hold the UK government to account over foreign interventions, trade policy and support for anti-democratic regimes. Independently and through Liberal International and the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, the UK Liberal Democrats support sister parties around the globe. Often taking personal risks or facing travel bans, Liberal Democrats frequently engage in election monitoring and international training. Senior party figures take key issues to the United Nations, with the UN Human Rights Council and elsewhere. Through these many initiatives, the party is also better able to see the bigger picture in public policy and in economics in an international context. The Lib Dems' global reach can have a profound impact. In Europe today, via Lib Dem European Group and other institutions, the Lib Dems work with colleagues on climate change, gender equality internationally, and LGBTQ plus rights. This continues the extraordinary pan-European impact the Liberal Democrat MEPs historically had in the European Parliament. The Lib Dems' principled opposition to the Iraq War in 2003 still resonates today. It underpins support for rules-based global governance and scrutiny of UK adherence to international law. Long-term work over human rights also continues in places like Myanmar, Cameroon, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Nigeria, Kashmir and the wider Middle East. The party has a robust system of international institutions, including the Federal International Relations Committee and its subcommittees on China and Europe. The party has the Lib Dems overseas, with active members across the world. There are country-specific organizations too, like the Chinese Lib Dems. Lib Dems in international development focus on sustainable development whilst opposing aid cuts back home. Policy forums are held by the Liberal International British Group and the Paddy Ashdown Forum, with audiences from around the world. Former MEPs have developed an international network keeping the European dream alive. Promoting liberal democratic principles and values across the four corners of the earth helps citizens to resist dictatorship. Also helps develop close relations with diaspora in the UK. The UK is not an isolated, sealed unit like North Korea. World events, global best practice and cooperative endeavour all really matter if the United Kingdom is to progress. Please support us.
Hello and welcome back. This session we will be debating F35 International Trade and the DIT, which you can find in your agenda on page 94. And there is one amendment on page 96A. Um, I'd like to ask Tim Farron to stand by to move the amendment. And we'll go straight in with uh, Sarah Olney from Twickenham and Richmond to move the motion. Sarah. Thank you very much, Joe. The Department for International Trade under Liz Truss has raced to chalk up a number of trade deals, mostly to flaunt the fact that the UK now has the ability to do so. The vast majority of these have been rollover agreements, continuing the terms of trade that we had when we were members of the European Union. These have been necessary in order to maintain our existing trade links. And perhaps its continuation of the status quo is an implicit recognition of the fact that the EU trading bloc was able to negotiate pretty decent terms. We have yet to see how these rollover agreements will evolve. If the UK are able to negotiate better terms of trading partners in the future, will the UK benefit also, or will we be left behind? The first real new deal of the post-Brexit age is the UK-Australia FTA. And this is what has given us our first glimpse of what might be possible now that we can strike deals as an independent trade negotiator. And the answer is firstly, not much. And secondly, a potentially very poor deal for farmers and consumers. Australia farms cows and sheep in a very different way to the UK. It has the land available to be able to farm much larger numbers of livestock on a single farm, making it more competitive. These methods of farming, however, frequently mean lower levels of animal welfare and food standards than we have here in the UK. There are farming practices and treatments widely in use in Australia that are banned in the UK, and their use of antibiotics is, for some animals, 16 times the level of equivalent animals in this country. Allowing the import of beef and sheep meat from Australia will mean lower prices for UK consumers, but at the cost of undercutting UK farmers and putting them out of business. Everybody accepts there are difficult trade-offs to be made between prices and incomes. It's important, therefore, that MPs have ample opportunity to debate these trade-offs and consider carefully how they will impact not just their own constituents, but the country as a whole. They must be able to make those choices on each individual trade deal and for those decisions to be binding on the government. But the government has excluded Parliament from scrutiny of trade deals. The only person who will decide these difficult trade-offs will be the Secretary of State for International Trade. A flimsy excuse for parliamentary scrutiny called CRAG after the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, which implemented the process, is being utilised instead. But it doesn't provide for either a debate or a vote. It ought to be possible for us to use access to the sixth largest economy in the world to agree terms with our trading partners that go beyond economic benefits. Chief amongst the outcomes we should be able to negotiate are commitments on tackling climate change. And yet, documents leaked to Sky News 10 days ago show that the UK agreed to remove commitments to limiting global warming to specific temperatures in order to get the Australia deal over the line. Australia is a good friend to the UK. We share historical ties, a language, a head of state. It's very worrying that this first deal, which everybody agreed would be the easiest, has already given so much away. It reveals that far from being able to strike better deals outside the EU, the UK is in a weak negotiating position. Perhaps the government hopes to use its economic leverage more effectively against developing countries who have more to gain from having greater access to the UK market. And yet, in signing a rollover deal with Cameroon, the government made no effort to address the human rights abuses being committed against the BR people in that country. Finally, I want to talk about investor state dispute settlements. This enables private companies to sue national governments if their policies have a negative impact on their company's revenues. This process must absolutely be resisted. Not only does it undermine democratic decision making, it can also prohibit public policy goals to improve education, healthcare and the environment. I'm pleased that this motion comes out strongly against the use of such dispute resolution mechanisms. Conference. This is the first time in many years that we have had to think seriously about the challenges and opportunities of international trade deals. I very much welcome that we brought forward such a comprehensive and progressive motion at this conference, and I ask you all to vote for it. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Can I ask Callum Miller to stand by? And I now call Tim Farron to move the amendment. Tim? Tim? 
Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Sarah. It's a great motion. Um, I would like you to make it even better by passing Amendment 1. We have, you might have noticed, a rubbish electoral system. It breeds two horse races. In the countryside, however, uh, one of those horses is the Liberal Democrats. You have a Conservative Party that takes the countryside for granted, and the Liberal Democrats determined to serve those communities and to be their champion. Nowhere is that more apparent than when it comes to trade deals and their impact upon farmers. Because the Tories, from their position of weakness, have delivered a dreadful deal with Europe, and they're now desperate for any old deal with anyone else. And they're prepared to, indeed happy, to throw the farmers of the United Kingdom under the bus in order to get those deals. British farming, it is often said, is the best in the world. But we understand why that is the case. And unlike the Tories, we care. You see, British farming is the best in the world because unlike so many other countries, as Sarah so rightly described, our farming is based upon the unit of the family farm, as opposed to huge industrial or ranch style farming in other countries. That's why animal welfare standards are high. That's why environmental standards are high. That's why quality and safety is high, indeed the highest in the world. It's Britain, by the way, that ensured that Europe kept up with our standards rather than the other way round. This amount Amendment would ensure that all trade deals would have British high standards as the minimum for any partner country to export to the United Kingdom. That's how it's been in Europe, with the European Union following our high standards. We have a track record, therefore, of having an ethical trade policy, and so we surely want a global Britain to be also a green Britain, an ethical Britain, a Britain that leads with the highest of standards. Not a Britain that bows and scrapes and throws those standards away, sacrificing our farmers in order to get any old deal. This happens to be happening at exactly the same time as the government, in its cloth-eared style, is uh, botching the transition from the old payment system for farming to the new one, which will see hundreds, if not thousands, of family farms go out of business. And that is not just heartbreaking for people like me and for farmers and communities like mine. It is also calamitously dangerous because we could have the best environmental policies in the world, but without farmers to put those policies into practice, they are meaningless bits of paper. There is nothing that terrifies a Tory MP in Cumbria, Cornwall or the Cotswolds more than their farmers realising that the Tories or a vote for the Tories is a vote to damage farming. So let's now provide those farmers and all who care for animal welfare and for our environment with the best reason to switch their support to the Liberal Democrats. Please back Amendment 1 and please back up the motion. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. Can I ask Paul Reynolds, please, to stand by? And I now call Callum Miller from South East Oxfordshire. Callum. Thanks very much, Joe. Conference, I'm delighted to have this chance to speak in favour of the motion and in favour of the amendment to it. Because when it comes to trade, the Tory government have shown that when they talked about taking back control, they just meant for them and their donors. This motion would give Parliament and the people greater oversight of our trade policies. Trade policy reaches far into our lives, from the food we eat to the way we travel about, from the medicines that keep us well to the technology that enables our lives. Choices in trade policy shape the way we live. In particular, as the last two years have certainly taught us, changes to trade policy can have huge impacts on particular sectors with profound economic and social effects. If we've learned anything from the backlash against the hyper-liberalisation of global markets, it should be that we need to set trade policy in an inclusive and participatory way. The cornerstone of this approach should be accountability to Parliament. Yet the UK has one of the weakest forms of parliamentary scrutiny of trade deals, for example, when compared to the government's favourite partner, the US. There are three parts to any trade negotiation. A negotiating mandate is set, a negotiation takes place, and a final deal is ratified and implemented. In every one of these, the US administration is required by law to engage with the Senate. Through the Trade Promotion Authority, the Senate sets the mandate. The administration has to provide regular briefings throughout negotiations. And finally, the Senate has to approve the final deal. Instead, in the UK, Parliament is notified when the government has concluded a negotiation and given just 21 days to object. Why should we settle for such a secretive approach, one which hands all the control to the government and means Parliament is reduced to a procedural afterthought? But beyond Parliament, deals should also be informed by the experience and knowledge of business owners, workers and consumer groups. 
and as importantly, their involvement will make any deal more durable. Yet this government has treated these stakeholders with casual indifference. It has formed some trade advisory groups, largely consisting of big business, but these groups meet irregularly and they do so in secret. The use of blanket non-disclosure agreements has stopped their members talking about the discussions. So an apparent effort to open the trade policy process has had the opposite effect. We should change this. Finally, conference, we should in particular all be worried by the government's approach to food imports, as Tim has just said. The Tories' 2019 manifesto promised not to compromise on our high environmental protection, animal welfare and food standards. Yet when the first trade deal came round with Australia, that's exactly what they did, as it contained no such protections uh, and gave the Australians tariff-free, quota-free access for their agricultural products. That's why I was proud to be one of over a million people who supported the National Farming Union's campaign to uphold UK food standards. And that is why I support Amendment 1. Conference as Liberal Democrats, we stand for fair trade and open democracy. This motion and the amendment support both. Please vote for them. Thank you so much, Callum. Can I ask Jack Fleming from Camden Borough to stand by, please? And I now call Paul Reynolds from Hammersmith and Fulham. Paul, are you there? Hi, Paul. Hi, Off you go. Yes, I, I'm almost certainly here. <laughs> um, this motion, uh, which I'm strongly in the support of, uh, deals with the question of the trade deals which have been uh, agreed or are under negotiation uh, outside of the European Union. Some of them replacement deals, as Sarah was talking about, and some of them attempted new deals. Uh, the extraordinary thing for us politically is the way in which these deals are believed by a significant part of the population to be better than the situation that we had before. And this is certainly not the case. The UK is now in a much worse position in terms of trade than it used to be uh, before uh, Brexit. And this is a, a most extraordinary thing. And why is it? And uh, one of the reasons is, as Sarah said, that, and uh, as Callum said, the uh, parliament, parliament does not get a chance to vote the deals down. Uh, so this neuters uh, the political process. And also the media, uh, which is broadly pro-Brexit, is a cheerleader for things which largely have been spun by the government as favourable when they're uh, often quite the opposite. And I want to give some specific examples of, of, of how the reality and the spin don't, don't match. I mean, the Japan deal uh, was, which is our EU replacement deal, uh, was described as something which was far better than the situation that we had before. This is entirely a uh, nonsense. Uh, the uh, the so-called quotas that the United Kingdom have were quotas that were only left over when the EU had used up theirs. I mean, this is a, a sort of undignified for the, for the United Kingdom. And it had the EU-Japan um, uh, deal had uh, most favoured nation clauses in it. So it means that if the UK did get anything better out of Japan than the EU had, then, the, then Japan would have to offer those terms back to the European Union. So it was impossible that it could have been any better as the government was uh, claiming. It was an utter nonsense. And we had the same thing with the deal on uh, Norway and Iceland, where the government was saying it was a better deal. The Prime Minister and the Main Industry Association um, in, uh, in Norway and Iceland were saying, uh, this is not a very good deal, really. It's not better than the situation the UK had before. Uh, and we're very clear about that. And we're, we're contradicting what the UK side negotiators and what the Daily Mail was saying about it. And then most laughably for me is the, this uh, enormous investment the government is making in so-called free ports, uh, which is really uh, uh, has not has sort of partially run aground. But the point is that most of the, uh, the, the EU replacement trade deals, uh, they had duty exemption provisions, which mean that the whole point of the free port being there in the first place uh, didn't apply. So they wasted their money, they wasted their billions, uh, billions building free ports that have no particular advantage uh, relative to the ones that they had claimed uh, before. So uh, Sarah mentioned the uh, Australia deal and the difficulties with that. But the main point, uh, it seems to me that a government minister has been promoted on the back of 
these uh, spun trade deals. Uh, but my view is she should have been sacked, not promoted. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. So can I ask Rob Harrison from Liberal Democrats in Europe to stand by, please? And I now call Jack Fleming from Camden. Jack, are you there? Thank you. Uh, good evening, conference. There are many people here more qualified than me to discuss the technical nuances of international trade policy. You've heard from some of them already. Instead, I'm here to talk about values. Values like human rights, democracy and environmentalism, which have been restated so eloquently this weekend across discussions of federalism, carbon taxes, universal basic income, and so much more. International trade might not inspire the same passion as these laudable policies, but I would contend that our values are no less central to tonight's discussion. Trade is central to how nations interact, exchanging not only goods and services, but people and ideas. And despite the best efforts of a certain breed of narrow-minded nationalists, our exports from financial services, technology, to creative arts remain in demand around the world. This means our trade policy is powerful. And if we've learned anything from Spider-Man, it's that with great power comes great responsibility. Responsibility which must be exercised by parliament. If we believe, as I do, that fundamental rights do not stop at the water's edge, then we have a moral imperative to foster those rights around the world. This is why lines 17 to 20 and 45 to 50 are so important. They assert the role of trade policy in limiting conflict and oppression and in progressing human rights and labour and environmental standards globally. Baseline standards would ensure that UK consumers are not inadvertently complicit in abuses, whether of people or planet, while the benefits of market access would encourage other nations to continually uphold these standards. Amendment 1, which I also support, adds agricultural standards to this list, preventing a race to the bottom in food and farming, which would be bad for both consumers and the environment. This motion also allows for the possibility of conditionality to further advance these values in future and to punish their erosion. This approach has long been a feature of EU trade policy, for example, through the generalised scheme of preferences, GSP+, and everything but arms initiatives, which include carrots of lower barriers to reward progress, as well as sticks of higher barriers to punish backsliding. The EU's use of trade policy to foster fundamental rights is imperfect, but nonetheless, it provides an example of what's possible, of what we could do to help foster these rights. And alignment with the EU in terms of trade standards, conditionality, and so much more would make rejoining the union that much easier when the time comes. Conference. Our values have always been inextricably interwoven, both at home and abroad. This motion reasserts the place of those values in our interactions with the wider world. And I urge you to support both Amendment 1 and this motion as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. So can I ask Tim Farron to stand by to summate on the amendment? And I now call uh, Rob Harrison from Liberal Democrats in Europe. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Conference, for giving me this opportunity to talk about free trade. One of our predecessor parties, the Liberals, actually fought election at the beginning of the 20th century on the concept of free trade and was fairly successful. But free trade doesn't just mean free for all trade. Free trade has to be fair trade. It has to respect rules. It has to respect human rights, the environment, animal welfare, as Tim has emphasized to us, and the sensitivities of different countries without being protectionists. And this is what we're trying to do with this motion. The negotiation for free trade must be transparent. There must be open discussions. And it's interesting that Callum just talked to us about how it goes on in the Senate in the United States. I myself had the pleasure of actually appearing in front of an Australian select committee, they're one of their equivalent to their select committees, to talk about 
the impact of free trade between the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth of Australia. It was an open discussion. I'd already made a submission on behalf of small businesses in Europe about why it was important that the free trade agreement be negotiated and how it would benefit both European businesses and Australian businesses. And that was even before there had been a mandate established. The Parliament of Australia was emphasising that mandate. Where's that been in Westminster? Nowhere. We also got to be concerned about dispute resolution procedures. There will always be disputes between countries about free trade. There will always be disputes between various companies and uh, countries about free trade, whether these are protectionist measures or whether they're justified on human health grounds. Australia has been criticised, for example, for its tobacco advertising policy. And yet it won that case in front of an open democratic forum and not just behind closed but, uh, st uh, closed rooms. Yes, we may have lower prices, and yes, we should have lower prices for some items where it is justified and where we can actually gain advantages. But free trade is not just about lowering those tariff barriers. That's what you might think about if you hear a lot of the parliamentary party, conservative parliamentary party at this stage, who just want to get rid of everything because it will lead to lower prices. No, it's also about opportunities as well, opportunities for British exporters to be able to export their goods around the world. But there's also a human element to it. There are opportunities that can be given. Young people have the opportunity to go and work in Australia. Australian Australians have the opportunity to come and work in the UK. My mother, more than 50 years ago, actually had that opportunity, met my dad, and here I am, a product of that union. And it's not only that. Australia is a scientific powerhouse, just like the United Kingdom is a scientific powerhouse. And free trade can actually encourage the interchange between the two of our countries. So conference, I would urge you to support this motion as it stands. It's not just about Australian free trade, which I've emphasised because I am Australian as well as being British. It's also about how we approach free trade deals in the future, how we make certain that we have a minimum set of standards, how we make certain that we also make certain that we get parliamentary scrutiny, small and medium sized business input into those free trade agreements so that we have successful agreements that work for the United Kingdom, that work for our country, the country partners, and that basically shows that the UK is a global country and not just one based on itself. Support the motion, please. And also, Tim, thanks for your amendment. That needs to be supported as well. Thank you, conference. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. So I'm now going to ask Philip Bennion to stand by to submit on the motion. And I call Tim Farron. We the treat today as we get Tim Farron twice in this debate. I, I, I hope the lighting is better this time, Tim. You were a bit dark last time. Can I call Tim Farron to come back and uh, summate on Amendment 1, Tim? I'm, I'm uh, illuminated, illuminated by one of my kids' study lamps, so, you know, I, I, look, I look sort of mysterious. Um, well, look, it's been a great debate, and I'm very grateful to everybody who's taken part in it so far. Uh, one, one of the... Um, indignities or punishments I had to endure during the years of the coalition was that I got stuck on the uh, EU scrutiny committee um, uh, and uh, that was chaired by Bill Cash and should we say most people on that committee were not massively pro-European Union even the Labour ones and it struck me then how poor we were as a parliament at scrutinising any EU legislation whatsoever it probably contributed to this wrong view that we suddenly we, we kind of took this legislation and had no say over it we could have had say over it the fact is that our parliament Parliament just uh, chose to ignore it and just complain about it from the sidelines. I'm afraid that is an approach that has 
carried on beyond Brexit. As, as Sarah and others have said, um, that our parliament has the weakest of scrutiny uh, when it comes to trade deals. It's not right that a trade secretary gets to have the say and parliament has no say and therefore consumers and farmers and the country as a whole have none whatsoever. Um, so, I mean, Paul Reynolds is absolutely right to talk about the impact that trade deals have upon uh, the environment. Uh, Callum Miller, who spoke about the, the that weak scrutiny, but also recognised the importance of open democracy to trade deals of all kinds, whether they're good, bad or indifferent. I thought Jack's points about values was really important. If you get involved in politics, you want to change the world. What better way to change the world than to use your consumer powers when the largest economies in the world to help ensure there are trade deals that lift standards for animals, that improve environmental standards and other standards too. And Rob Harris said something crucial to Liberal Democrats. You see, we do believe in free markets. We do believe in free trade, but no markets are truly free and no trade is truly free if it is not also fair. And that is what we're seeking to do through this amendment, is to give Parliament the ability to uh, ensure that trade deals that are passed by our, our Parliament are scrutinised by our Parliament and indeed rejected by our Parliament if they do not um, instil and indeed enforce those high standards and those values, those ethics that we take so very seriously. And politically, the reason why this amendment is important and why the whole motion is important is because I want us to appeal to the country. I want us to win. Um, you know, following on from the comments that Sarah made at the beginning, I'm going to observe that this is the kind of policy that goes down well in Richmond in Surrey and Richmond in Yorkshire. So let's be the party that fights for, uh, for rural Britain, but also for those who care for our environment. Let's pass Amendment 1 and the motion as a whole. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So I finally call Phil Bennion from Litchfield, Tamworth and Burton, who is uh, chair of the Federal International Relations Committee of the Liberal Democrats, to submit on the motion. Philip. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, yes, uh, this is an area where we currently don't have any policy because um, obviously trade was uh, a, a European Union competence and uh, so we've been left um, poli without policy. But I, I have to say that our parliamentarians have been doing, doing a pretty good job. Um, what we're trying to do here is actually f deliver a guideline policy um, this is why it's quite a short motion, um, but it, it's really very much along the lines that uh, Tim and Sarah and others have already already been following. Um, so it's an, it's urgent that we actually get the, the, the resolution through, the motion through. Um, and uh, of course, what we've seen our government doing is going in completely the opposite direction with its uh, attempts to uh, either roll over trade deals or, or, or put new ones together, as as we have, as has been pointed out very, very obviously by by Sarah herself, and then by uh, Paul Reynolds, who actually pointed out that the the rollover deals and the new deals are actually worse than the ones we had before, uh, despite the fact that our press very often tries to make them out as being better. Um, and uh, the point on values that uh, Jack made is very, very important. I mean, uh, yes, the uh, the EU does have uh, values embedded in its own trade policies. Um, and even though, as he says, they're not perfect, I know that. Uh, my last job was on the Vietnam trade deal with the EU before, uh, before Brexit. And uh, despite the fact that we managed to put some very strong uh, con human rights conditionality in it in the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, when it went back to the Trade Committee, the, uh, there was a more mercantilist view and it got uh, watered down. But still, they are there. And what we're seeing from our government now is, uh, particularly in the Cameroon and uh, Cambodia deals, is uh, and where both of those countries have been uh, subject to uh, withdrawal of, of everything but arms privilege, privileges, Cameroon by the United States, uh, Cambodia by the European Union. Uh, we find uh, that, uh, that Liz Truss has gone out there and completely ignored human rights altogether. So uh, uh, coming on to, uh, to the um, amendment, yes, we, I think we're perfectly happy to uh, accept the amendment. Well, I am personally, as a farmer myself, uh, I'm very, very much aware that, um, uh, of, of the dangers here. In fact, I cut a video some time ago, about uh, three or four years ago, outside Parliament, saying farmers face a triple whammy, not only removal of uh, the support, uh, but um, uh, facing uh, 
imports from uh, around the world, which they're not allowed to produce at that standard themselves. So um, we try to keep it in general in the um, in, in the original motion, but I think it's very valuable uh, to to add add the amendment. Um, Rob Harrison, yes, you're absolutely right. We are in favour of free trade, uh, but those but trade deals are are negotiated, and uh, uh, you're absolutely and and I can see that you understand also that we should not be uh, following a a run to the bottom here because you have to protect your standards. And uh, another thing that Jack pointed out is that um, uh, y- 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 th- this is this actually affects uh, affects our, um, our, our our trade with the EU and and possibly even our uh, attempts to rejoin or or join the uh, customs union or the uh, or the single market in the future. If we're awash with substandard goods. Uh, it could it could compromise our trade with the European Union, of course, which is a much bigger area of trade than some of these bits and pieces we're picking up around the world. So I think that uh, um, there's been no real opposition to this um, uh, to, to this motion. So please support it, uh, support the amendment, and uh, give our uh, parliamentarians at least a basis uh, to uh, to know that they're acting. Um, within party policy rather than just going out on their own. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. So that concludes the debate. We'll now move to the votes. The first vote will be on Amendment 1, which is on page 96A of your agenda. And that will be, uh, that will be visible as soon as... Uh, that will already be visible when I've said this. So have at it. And welcome back. So the result of that vote is for the amendment 153 and against 7. 7. Um, the next vote is on the substantive uh, motion, so please vote now.
And welcome back. So the results of that vote is 174 in favour and six against. So that concludes the, uh, the, the debates in the auditorium for today. So I hope you've had a lovely time. We certainly have. And we'll see you back tomorrow morning. If you want to stick around, there is some comedy in the late fringe. So do go and enjoy that. I'm sure it's going to be marvellous. Have a nice day. Ta-da. <laughs>